Before leaving Massilia to face the forces of Lucius Afranius and Marcus Petrius in Hispania, Caesar placed Gaius Trebonius in command of his land forces, and put Decimus Junius Brutus in charge of building a fleet of ships to blockade Massilia's harbour. After Caesar departed for Hispania, Lucius Domitius Enobarbus, who, along with his son, had been pardoned and released following Caesar's successful siege of Corfinium, now arrived at Massilia by boat, where he took over as commander of Massilia's defence. After building a fleet of 17 ships, outnumbering the 12 built by Brutus, Enobarbus sailed out in an attempt to break Brutus's harbour blockade. The Massiliote ships, though smaller than their Roman counterparts, were more mobile than Brutus's bulky and slow-turning vessels. Because Enobarbus could not afford to remove the professional legions from their posts, guarding Massilia's high walls and manning her ballistae, he pressed Massilia's merchants, farmers, and other volunteers into service. Armed with javelins, arrows, stones, and miscellaneous missiles, Enobarbus's strategy was to exploit the cumbersome maneuverability of Brutus's plodding ships by launching his smaller and more navigable fleet quickly around the opponent, simultaneously raining down missile fire. By keeping them at a distance, Enobarbus would spare his farmer and merchant army from fighting hand to hand against Brutus's more experienced legions. Using the agility of his 17 ships, and his safe distance for discharging missile fire, Enobarbus's fleet zigzagged around Brutus, blitzing his ships with missile attack. Unfortunately, manned as they were by non military men pressed into service, the Massiliotes eventually passed too near to Brutus's fleet, and were caught in the larger ship's grappling hooks. Using the traditional Corvus boarding bridge, Brutus's men boarded the Massiliote ships, and turned the engagement into hand-to-hand -hand combat, which left Enobarbus's men slaughtered. With more than half of his 17 ships lost to Brutus, Enobarbus was forced to withdraw, and return to Massilia, under Brutus's ongoing blockade. Brutus's victory over the fleet of Enobarbus took place around the same time that Caesar, in Hispania, had built his secret bridge across the river Segre, giving him the ability to stop the Pompeian forces from foraging on the east side of the river. Gaius Trebonius, who was left in charge of Caesar's land legions at Massilia, followed the standard procedure for besieging a town by digging trenches, towers, siege ramps, and a contravallation, completely cutting off all access to the town from inland. But, having very high walls, mounted with ballistae, the town of Massilia was highly defensible, making the building of siege towers difficult under constant missile fire. To circumvent this problem, Gaius Trebonius ordered his architects to build a fireproof roof for his siege tower, after completion of only the first floor. This roof, however, was not attached, but instead was placed atop the siege tower, like a lid, with extended eaves, to ensure flaming missiles fell clear of the tower. With the added completion of each of the siege tower's floors, screws and pulleys were used to raise the lid just high enough to allow the next floor to be built beneath its protective covering. In this way, Gaius Trebonius successfully built a six-story siege tower, which now looked down onto the top of Massilia's walls. Using the same fireproof coverings, Trebonius also ordered a siege terrace, approximately 65 feet in length, to be built at the base of the siege tower. Moving both the tower and the terrace up the siege ramps, Trebonius's men, manning their own ballistae atop the siege tower, now fired down on the Massiliotes atop the city's walls, while the legions filed into the terrace, prying and ripping the stones right out of Massilia's walls. As the walls began to crumble, the Massiliotes came forward and surrendered. They acknowledged Trebonius's victory over Massilia, and asked for a ceasefire until the arrival of Caesar, whom they hoped would negotiate favourable terms of surrender. Gaius Trebonius accepted Massilia's request, and hostilities ceased. Within his own camp, however, Trebonius's decision was met with harsh criticism. His legions, after months of digging and foraging, building siege towers, and working under a constant hailstorm of fire, anticipated as their reward, the raising of the town of Massilia. They had counted on pilfering Massilia's temple treasures, 
abducting its women, and selling its children into slavery. But now, having agreed to let the Massiliotes negotiate with Caesar, Gaius Trebonius had taken from them the rewards they deemed their right by conquest. Although we do not know exactly how he did so, we are told that only with, quote, great difficulty, end quote, did Trebonius regain control of his angry legions. Unfortunately, the Massiliotes' promise of a ceasefire was very quickly broken. Once Trebonius's legions, who had pulled back behind the trenches, were under control, the Massiliotes crept out of the town during the night, and set fire to the ramps, and the walls, the terrace, and even the six-story siege tower. Although the Romans attempted to defend their siege works, the Massiliotes had already inflicted significant damage by the time the Caesareans caught on, and they were unable to stop the infernos. Despite the setback, Gaius Trebonius, back to square one, began building a new siege tower, and another 65-foot terrace. This tower and terrace, however, he wisely built from brick, which would not burn, preventing the Massiliotes from a repeat performance. Lucius Domitius Enobarbus, by commandeering and refitting old warships and merchant vessels, was able to replace those ships he had lost to Decimus Junius Brutus, bringing the total number of his fleet back up to 17. After pressing more farmers and merchants into service, Enobarbus received word that Pompeius Magnus had sent him a naval reinforcement of 16 additional ships, under the command of Lucius Nasidius. Although these ships were built quickly, most came equipped with battering rams, which would be advantageous against Brutus, and his grappling hooks. Ordering all men to their vessels, Enobarbus sailed toward the island of Taroas, where Lucius Nasidius's fleet would be arriving. Decimus Junius Brutus's blockade of Massilia, however, did not include the Taroas side because Gaius Scribonius Curio, who had also been given forces by Caesar, and ordered to Sicily, was in charge of stopping any Pompeian forces from getting through either the Sicilian Straits, or the Straits of Messina. Relying on Scribonius meant that Brutus's blockade of Massilia needed only to prevent aid flowing from Africa or Hispania, as the Caesareans controlled everything between Gaul and Italy. But Gaius Scribonius Curio had failed in his duty, and Lucius Nasidius crossed the Sicilian Straits with his fleet of 16, and sailed straight to the island of Taroas. Brutus, who had captured six of Enobarbus's ships during the previous engagement, manned them with legionnaires. With his fleet, Brutus gave chase, sailing after Enobarbus towards the island of Taroas. There, Brutus's 18 ships faced the 17 ships belonging to Enobarbus, and the 16 under the command of Lucius Nasidius. Having already fought, and defeated the Massiliotes, Brutus went after them first, having a clear understanding of their naval tactics. The Massiliotes did not disappoint. Employing the same style of increased maneuverability, the Massiliotes sought to destroy Brutus's ships with heavy missile fire. However, just as before, the Massiliotes eventually sailed too close, allowing themselves to be incapacitated by Brutus's grappling hooks, boarded for hand-to-hand -hand combat, and totally butchered. For reasons that are still unknown today, Lucius Nasidius did not enter into the Battle of Taroas. Seeing that the engagement was lost, he withdrew, commanding his fleet to follow. When the Massiliotes saw Nasidius leaving, many of them withdrew as well, fleeing back to Massilia. Without losing a single ship, and experiencing only light casualties, Decimus Junius Brutus won the battle. Five of Enobarbus's ships were sunk, and four were captured by Brutus. Despite their brief victory over the siege works of Trebonius, their failure to lift Brutus's blockade cost the town of Massilia dearly. Unable to renew supplies by land or water, and under siege for four long months, the town suffered severely. Famine and disease ran rampant throughout the city, with no relief in sight. When Caesar's forces, returning from Hispania, reached Massilia, the town knew the conquering general had been victorious. No last-minute aid was coming to rescue the Massiliotes now. On September 6 of the 49 BC year, Massilia formally surrendered to Caesar. 
Lucius Domitius Enobarbus, however, was determined not to fall into Caesar's hands a second time. To be pardoned by Caesar, as if Caesar were king, was bad enough, but it would be even more humiliating to be pardoned by him a second time, relegating Enobarbus to the role of evil villain in juxtaposition to Caesar's magnanimous mercy. So, taking three ships, Lucius Domitius Enobarbus made a daring escape through Brutus's blockade. Although two of the ships were captured, the one carrying Enobarbus miraculously escaped, heading for Greece. There, Enobarbus would rendezvous with Pompeius Magnus, and the rest of Rome's true senate, and maybe, together, a plan could be devised which would rid them, once and for all, of Gaius Julius Caesar.